All right, hi everyone. So yeah, my name is Justin Chowdhury, and today I'll be talking about doing analog modeling with wave digital filters in C++. Uh, just a heads up, all of these slides will be online. There will be a link uh, somewhere that you guys can all see. So just a little bit more about me. I'm originally from Denver, Colorado. Uh, I used to study at Stanford University, and now I develop plugins uh, as Chowdhury DSP. So the reason why I wanted to give this talk and why I wanted to give this talk here is that I've been working with wave digital filters for a few years now, and I think they're uh, a really interesting and useful thing uh, as a signal processing engineer, but they're also a very challenging programming problem when you look at how you would implement wave digital filters uh, to use in an audio plugin or some, some sort of uh, audio application. And I've had trouble kind of explaining this to people because I find that Oftentimes, people who are more interested in the theoretical signal processing aspect of it uh, maybe don't care so much about the implementation challenges, and some people who are more into programming who really understand the implementation challenges uh, maybe have a bit harder time wrapping their head around the signal processing, or maybe aren't as interested in that side of it. Uh, and so I thought that this audio programmer meetup would be a great place to talk about this stuff because uh, I think the audio programmer community is a great cross-section of people who uh, both care about and are interested in the signal processing and also uh, really care about the implementation challenges and understand the programming uh, aspects that we're going to get into today. So first I wanted to give a quick shout out to a bunch of people who have really helped me uh, understand all of the stuff that I'll be talking about today. From the Wave Digital Filter side, Julius Smith and then Kurt and JJ. Uh, have been really wonderful and patient with me in explaining uh, all of these rather in-depth topics. Uh, and then on the C++ side, Ayal and Paul showed me some really wonderful tricks and pointed out some, uh, some issues with some of my early implementations and things like that that really helped me kind of learn and improve on them from there. So yeah, just a quick outline of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'll give a quick introduction to the signal processing behind wave digital filters. Uh, I'll talk about an implementation that I did using polymorphism, and then another implementation using templates. And then finally, uh, I'll show you all my current wave digital filter library and talk about some of the future things I'm hoping to work on there. So yeah, wave digital filters is a big, big topic. So this is the, the, the 10 minutes short version. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't think uh, we'll have time for anything super in-depth, but hopefully I can get across the fundamentals idea, fundamental ideas that uh, you'll need to understand to understand the implementation challenges that I'll talk about next. So wave digital filters are a way that you might approach modeling an analog circuit. So if you've got a guitar pedal or some rack gear or something that you want an emulation of uh, that could run on your computer or on your phone or on... Uh, I don't know, your favorite embedded device, then you might want to model that circuit and you might use wave digital filters for modeling it. And what makes wave digital filters a little bit different from other circuit modeling uh, paradigms is that WDFs allow circuit elements to be discretized independently from each other. And so what this allows is kind of a modular circuit emulation approach where you sort of have these different pieces and you kind of stick them together to create the full, the full circuit uh, architecture. And what I like about this most is that uh, I, I like to describe it as modeling simple circuits is simple. So if you've got a simple circuit, the wave digital filter model of that circuit will be pretty simple as well. So as a very simple sort of motivating example here, we'll be looking at this RC low pass filter. So there's just a resistor and a capacitor in series with your input voltage, which is, you know, in this case, your input signal. And then the output voltage is just the voltage across this capacitor at any point in time. So imagining that wave digital filters didn't exist, you might use a technique like, like nodal analysis to try to model this circuit. And the way that this works is you do this thing called the Laplace transform, which puts everything in terms of this S variable. And then you can derive this transfer function, which is the ratio of the output voltage to the input voltage, uh, and it looks something like this. <clears throat> and then from there, you have to discretize that transfer function. 
and there's several different discretization techniques you could use here, but in the end you'll probably wind up with a transfer function in the digital domain that looks something like this, where you've got these uh, what we call filter coefficients, b0, b1, and a1, and then you can implement that with a pretty standard uh, uh, digital filter. Now, one thing you might notice about this is that it's not very modular. And what I mean by that is that whenever you change a component value, you need to redo your discretization steps. So if this resistor changes, then we need to redo the discretization to compute the B0, B1, and A1, and basically recompute the entire digital transfer function. Um, so that's, you know, not, not great. Uh, but what's even worse is that a lot of the work that we've done cannot be reused because if we change the circuit topology in any way, then we need to rederive the analog transfer function pretty much from scratch. Uh, so that can be kind of annoying. Like even if we were to replace this capacitor with an inductor or some other circuit element, uh, the analog transfer function would change completely. So what if we could make it modular? What if we could discretize each component separately and then kind of stick them together? Well, the problem is with nodal analysis that won't work because you run into this issue of delay-free loops. Uh, and this is a slide that I've borrowed from one of Kurt Warner's presentations uh, where he goes through the math of trying to discretize each of these circuit elements separately and then stick them together with a, in, a, in a series configuration. And as you see, you wind up with this delay-free loop here. Um, and delay-free loops are not the worst thing overall, but you really don't want to run into them uh, in, a, in a very simple circuit model like this. So you, the delay-free loops are the kind of things you want to run into when you're working on really complicated circuits with, uh, you know, nonlinearities and stuff. And then there's various methods for resolving those delay-free loops. But for a very simple circuit like this, you, you don't really want to run into a delay-free loop at this point. So the way that wave digital filters gets around the delay-free loop problem is first by doing this change of variables. So in, in traditional circuit analysis, we use these things called Kirchhoff variables, which are the voltage and the current. And instead, WDFs use this idea of wave variables. And here we see kind of the, the definitions of these wave variables. So you've got an incident wave A and a reflected wave B. And the way that you can think about these is uh, sort of uh, in, in, this, in this way. So in the Kirchhoff domain, you've got some circuit element with an impedance R0, and you've got a voltage across that element, and you've got a current going through that element. In the wave domain, it's a little bit different. In the wave domain, we have the same circuit element with the same impedance R0, but now we have an incident wave A and a reflected wave B. And again, the definitions of those waves uh, in terms of V and, and I and, and R0 are all up here. So then what we need to do is sort of connect these circuit elements with these things called adapters. And so this example here uses a series adapter. So we've got a resistor R1 and a resistor R2, and these are connected in series uh, with this root node here. And we'll talk about the root node in a second. Um, but one thing that I think is kind of important to understand is that uh, the difference between an incident and a reflected wave kind of depends on which perspective you're looking at it from. So for example, this wave here is a reflected wave from the perspective of R1, but from the perspective of the series adapter, it's an incident wave. So that's just something to be careful about when you're thinking about this, that uh, a, a wave could be either incident or reflected depending on which perspective you're looking at it from. <coughs> So the rules for wave digital filters are something like this. Uh, every wave digital filter port will have three variables, the incident wave, the reflected wave, and the port impedance. Uh, for very simple nodes, what we call leaf nodes, you only have one port. So that would be like a resistor or a capacitor or an inductor or something like that. Uh, you can also have adapter nodes, which are two ports, three ports, or sometimes even more. Um, and these are often series adapters or parallel adapters. And the reason they're called adapters is that they adapt the port impedances of the attached elements so that you end up with one, what's called a reflection-free port. Um, and the reflection-free port is what allows us to have modularity without running into delay-free loops. 
Um, there's also these special leaf nodes that are called unadaptable, and these need to be at the root of the tree. Um, and this means, as you might expect, that uh, you can only have one unadaptable node in your wave digital filter tree. So commonly this will be something nonlinear like a diode or something like an ideal voltage source or current source. So when we think about the wave digital filter tree, we have our root node at the root of the tree, and then we've got our series adapter that leads to these two, what we call child elements, R1 and R2. Um, and the way that this sort of adapter process works is that since we know what R1 and R2 are, we have this free parameter of the port impedance that's facing the root node, and we can choose what this free parameter R0 is to make this port reflection free. And because it's a reflection free port, the root node only needs to know what this R0 uh, or R0 impedance is. It doesn't need to know anything about R1 or R2 or anything that's happening further down the tree. And so what's nice about this is that uh, if we change anything further down the tree, for example, we could change our resistor to a capacitor there, the only thing we need to do is recompute R0 and we can have our same model of the circuit just as before. And finally, we can choose our root node to be an ideal voltage source, and now we're back at our RC low pass filter example. So now that we have this WDF tree kind of set up and we know how to adapt our elements and things like that, uh, how do we actually compute the output of our circuit model? Well, you have a few steps like this. So first, you need to set some parameters. So if you have potentiometers or any other circuit elements that could change, you need to set those component values. Um, if you have an input, like a voltage source or current source, you need to set your source value. Um, and then you can actually start uh, doing the computation through the wave digital filter tree. So the way this works is there's three main steps. So first, you take all your leaf nodes and you look at their reflected waves and you propagate those reflected waves down to the root node. Then you compute whatever computation the root node needs to do to find the reflected wave from the root node. And then you propagate the incident waves back up to the leaf nodes. Uh, and we'll show what this looks like in a second. And then finally, you can compute your output voltage or current or whatever, uh, wh whatever value you need as the output of your circuit. So yeah, for wave digital filters, uh, when we propagate the reflected waves down to the root node, it looks something like this. So you've got R1 here and C2 there, and they both have these reflected waves. And then those go into the series node here, which has a reflected wave going into the root node. Right, so we propagate these reflected waves down into the root. Then at our root node, we do whatever computation we need to do to turn that reflected wave back into an incident wave, going back into the series adapter. Then the series adapter will take that incident wave, which comes in, and then uh, we'll propagate that incident wave back up to the leaf nodes like that. And then finally, we can just look at the voltage of our capacitor and that's the output of our wave digital filter circuit model. <coughs> so you might be looking at that and you might say, well, hey, that seems more complicated than the nodal analysis approach. And in a sense it is, I definitely understand that. But the advantage here is that all of the work that we just did can be reused for every other circuit model that we might wanna, that we might wanna look at. So for example, we can look at a nonlinear circuit here, which is the RC diode clipper. So all we've done is take our low pass filter and then put a diode pair on the end. And again, the output voltage is just gonna be the voltage across the capacitor or across the diode pair, depending on how you wanna look at it. And so what we can do here is construct a wave digital filter tree that's almost identical, except that now we put our diode pair at the root. Uh, we still have our capacitor here. And then this node instead of the resistor becomes the series combination of the resistor and the input voltage. And then instead of a series adapter, we just need a parallel adapter there. And we've got almost the same wave digital filter tree, but now for a completely different circuit. So yeah, this is just scratching the surface of wave digital filters. Uh, if you really want to learn more about this stuff, uh, I've got uh, links to a bunch of papers here. Uh, this uh, Alfred Fettweiss paper from 1986 uh, outlines a lot of the early development of wave digital filters, 
um, and, and is, is a really cool sort of more historical look at the field. Um, if you're looking for more sort of audio related stuff, David Ye and Julia Smith have some great papers uh, and Kurt Warner, uh, maybe from 2015 to present day has a ton of really, really wonderful wave digital filter papers. Uh, and I would highly recommend reading his PhD dissertation um, about wave digital filters. Uh, it's, it's a really nice, I don't know, maybe not necessarily a starting point, but once you already have a little bit of knowledge about how wave digital filters work, uh, Kurt just kind of lays out everything really neatly uh, and, and describes everything really well. Yeah, so now we can move on to sort of a more polymorphic implementation uh, of how we might implement wave digital filters in C++. So when I started working on, on implementing a wave digital filter library, uh, I started with something like this, because to me, the idea of wave digital filters mapped themselves really nicely onto sort of this uh, uh, object-oriented uh, paradigm of, of programming. And so that's kind of what I was working on here, where I say, OK, we know that every port has an incident wave, a reflected wave, and a port impedance. And we know that we're going to need to do these three things with that port at some point in time. And so from there, you can implement your resistor and your capacitor and your inductor as sort of being derived from that base class. It's not too difficult. And then for things that are more, uh, that, that have more than one port, uh, you can make a, a base class kind of like this, where you take pointers to the child elements and you store those. And then for example, with a series adapter, you can make that a three port. And then again, choose your child elements like this. And then uh, kind of the, the trick here is that when incident is called on your series adapter, that will in turn call the incident method of the child uh, the child elements in the tree. And then similar with the reflected um, with the, the reflected method. And then finally, we need to be able to probe our wave digital filter elements. So if we need the voltage over a wave digital filter uh, port, we can just do this um, this handy little uh, operation there. And it's pretty easy to get the voltage. So finally, we can actually run a full wave digital filter tree kind of like this. So um, we create a resistor, we create a capacitor, we give them some values for um, you know the resistance and capacitance there. And then we can take a series, we can make a series junction or series adapter that has child elements of the resistor and capacitor. And then finally our root element, the voltage source, uh, just needs a reference to the series adapter since that's the next thing down in the tree. And then to actually process a sample, uh, we just kind of need to do this. So we set our voltage to whatever the input voltage is. Then S1 reflected, this takes all the reflected nodes from the leaf nodes, propagates them down to the root. That becomes the incident wave into the root node. Then we compute the reflected wave from the root node and propagate that as incident waves back up the tree. So this was the, the three or four um, little diagrams that I showed earlier. And then finally, we just need to compute the voltage over our capacitor. Yeah. So what are some of the limitations of the polymorphic implementation? Well, the big one, and this was actually shown to me by uh, Paul Walker, who I mentioned earlier, um, is that the compiler is not able to inline most of the function calls. And we can take a look at that here in this little compiler explorer uh, window. Let me see if I can uh, get back to this. Oh, here we go. Yeah, so if we look at this code in Compiler Explorer, we'll see that in the process sample method, we have all of these call instructions. And what's happening there is actually, maybe we can uh, get it to show us where it is. Scroll to source. Yeah, there we go. So when we're calling port one reflected, the compiler doesn't know what that reflected method is. It just knows that the wave digital filter base class has a reflected method, and this is a pointer to a wave digital filter, so the reflected method must exist, but we don't know what it is at, at compile time. So we have to use this call instruction to try to find where that method is and then run it from there. And so this is a, a real problem from an optimization standpoint. 
because uh, every time we call incident or reflected on a type that we don't know what it is, uh, we need to do what's called a vtable lookup. So each, uh, e each of these classes will have a sort of table of pointers to functions uh, that are implemented virtually, uh, which is what you know that virtual and override keywords uh, imply in C++. And so whenever we call incident, we need to do a vtable lookup to find where that function is, and then we can call it. Um, so at audio rates, I, I think that doing one vtable lookup per sample is, is slow, and so I try to avoid that wherever possible. Uh, but for wave digital filters, at least with the polymorphic implementation, things are actually much worse. And the reason why is that we need two vtable lookups for every node, uh, except for the root node, so that we can call incident and reflected once per sample. So even for this very simple RC low pass filter, uh, we need to do six vtable lookups every sample. And that's pretty slow. <coughs> yeah, so we don't want to have to do that. So how can we avoid doing that? And the answer that uh, Paul and Ayal helped me come up with was to implement wave digital filters using uh, templates. So the way that I would started to do this is by creating a little macro that would create these member variables for me. So it's the same member variables, the impedance, the incident wave, and reflected wave, but now instead of being defined through uh, a virtual interface or through a, through a base class, they're being defined just as, uh, as member variables here. So now to implement a leaf node, all we need to do is use the macro to create our member variables, and then we can use them uh, R, A, and B, just like any other member variables. Now in the adapters is where sort of the actual uh, important things happen. So give me a sec here. Yeah. So in the series adapters, instead of just taking pointers to our child uh, our child member variables, we actually need to declare the types of those children as template arguments, and then we can store references to those types. So now we know exactly what port one type is. So when we go to call port one dot incident, the compiler will know because it's a template argument exactly what incident method we're calling. So this will help us get around the uh, the vtable lookup problem. And then the probing methods are going to be a little bit different because, again, the compiler will need to know uh, the, the type of that wave digital filter element so that it can do the, uh, the probe computation. And so finally, creating the wave digital filter tree and running it will look almost the same as before. But now when we create our series adapter, we need to tell the series adapter uh, the types that will be going into it. So it's going to be the type of R1 and the type of C2 that will be combining with the series adapter. And then again, for the voltage source, we need to give it the type of the upstream node, which in this case is a series adapter. Um, and yeah, you can avoid using decal type if you want. Um, like you could just put resistor here and capacitor there. But then once you get to something like this voltage source here, uh, especially once you get these large wave digital filter trees, uh, these can become very long template arguments. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of important to use decal type there just to keep these type names reasonable. And now we can actually see how things have improved from this templating approach. Uh, so let's take a look here. Yeah, here we go. So again, it's the same code, just with templates instead of polymorphism. And now if we look at this process sample method, uh, you'll notice that there are no call instructions. Everything is just perfectly uh, inlined by the compiler. And again, both of these examples were with uh, full optimizations turned on. So uh, we expect the compiler to inline every, everywhere that it can. Cool. So what are some of the pros and cons of the templated implementation? Well, the pros are that the compiler can see through the entire processing code. So what that means is uh, the compiler knows exactly what instructions are going to need to be happening and in what order. And so that allows the compiler to inline everything. So you, 
you can avoid the overhead of doing a vtable lookup and, and uh, the overhead of calling a new function and you can inline everything and do whatever other optimizations you might want to do so maybe there uh, are two addition operations that could be kind of combined or you know some other more mathematical optimizations uh, that the compiler can see will be will be useful to do so yeah the compiler being able to see through the code is really wonderful for uh, for optimization and from my measurements this usually leads to somewhere between two and four times better performance uh, and we'll see some more numbers on that in a second <coughs> uh, the sort of the cons though are that the circuit topology has to be fixed at compile time so because the compiler needs to know which types are being combined uh, you no longer have the flexibility to say okay this resistor is now a capacitor uh, because the compiler would have had to know that at compile time um, the other cons are that the implementation is a bit more complicated so uh, if you actually look through the library code there's uh, just a bit more typing that has to go into it um, to make it work and then of course if you're new to C++ templates can be scary I definitely understand that um, so if you're if you're kind of new to C++ I know it can be uh, a, a bit tricky to start using a library with templates immediately And speaking of that, uh, I wanted to give a quick demonstration of my Wave Digital Filter library that I've been working on for uh, maybe the past couple years. So yeah, this is the library. Uh, there's a link to it here in the slides. Um, it's part of a larger repository that I maintain of mostly like useful juice things that I use fairly often. Um, and so because of that, it's under the GPL license because the whole repository is under the GPL license. Um, I may change that in the future. I, I might want to split off the Wave Digital Filter part um, of the library, maybe into its own repo, and maybe I'll put it under a, a more uh, permissive license, like a BSD or something like that. Um, and it can be used either as part of this juice module, or you can just include the Wave Digital Filter headers. Uh, and use it just as a header only library. So if you're not using Juice, it's still totally uh, totally possible to use this Wave Digital Filter library. Uh, you just have to include the headers. And then uh, it has both a templated API and a polymorphic API. So if you want to do compile time Wave Digital Filters or runtime uh, Wave Digital Filters with runtime flexibility, you could do either through the same library. So that's kind of nice. And then finally, there's a bunch of unit tests and documentation to make sure that uh, everything works, hopefully the way that we all expect it to. Uh, beyond that, there's a few more advanced things that we are kind of beyond things that we've talked about today. So there's some implementations of diodes and some other nonlinear elements. Uh, there's some implement implementations for what's called R-type adapters, which again, I haven't talked about today. Um, there's also... Uh, it, it, you, you can use different data types for your wave digital filters, so that could be a float or a double, or it could be a SIMD type, like a, a juice SIMD register, uh, or, or a SIMD register, or a, a SIMD type through XSIMD or some other SIMD library. Um, and plus, you can actually extend the library to include your own custom circuit elements. So maybe you've got uh, a custom diode implementation that you really like. Well, you can actually extend uh, the, the library to use your own diode implementation instead of the one in the library. As for performance, here's some numbers from uh, a little sort of measurement uh, uh, bake-off that I did with my friend Dirk who implemented a Wave Digital Filter library in Faust. Uh, this was maybe March of last year, I want to say. Um, maybe, maybe summer, I forget exactly. Uh, but yeah, you can see that the templated API is much more performant than the polymorphic API. Um, the Faust API or the Faust library is pretty good. It, it performs pretty well. Um, for for whatever reason, the feed forward circuit here, uh, the Faust uh, library was able to optimize that really really well. Uh, although I should mention that it took the Faust compiler like five minutes to compile that code, so uh, a little bit of a trade off there, but. Yeah, it's definitely a, a great op option if you're using Faust and you want to have Wave Digital Filters. Uh, I would definitely recommend taking a look at that. And then finally, there's some examples here. Uh, again, there's a link to the repository here. Um, 
but basically I've just got examples of a bunch of very simple circuits, so uh, voltage or current dividers, low pass filters, diode clippers. Uh, I've got an example of this Baxendahl EQ circuit uh, that I've been working on recently. I think it's pretty cool. And then uh, there's actually a wave digital filter prototyping tool, which I'll show you guys in a second. Uh, how do I do that? Okay. So yeah, this is a... Uh... Yeah, so that's a little guitar loop. And then uh, this is the low pass filter circuit that we were looking at. You can just do simple low pass filter things. Uh, there's a diode clipper. So you can do distortion pretty easily. And then the uh, the prototyper is something that I've been working on or that I, I was working on like a year ago. And then recently I tried to revive it a little bit. But the way that this works is you can actually sort of build your wave digital filter tree here. So this is our root node. And maybe we want that to be a diode pair. Uh, and then let's try to build a simple diode clipper here. So we can do a capacitor and a voltage source. And then we set the voltage source to be our input and the capacitor will be what we're probing to get our output. And then maybe we want our resistor to be uh, like a thousand ohms or something. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, you could make your capacitor a different value as well. Uh, I don't know, minus nine. And then for, uh, for the diodes, you can change some of the diode constants. And then you can actually change the number of diodes too, because the, the diode model that I use has some parameters for that. So we could even do like half a diode or something, which is kind of fun. Uh, but yeah, so that's... Uh, kind of how you can use the, the little prototyping tool there if you're curious about that stuff. So yeah, um, <clears throat> for next step that I'm hoping to do with this library, uh, right now I'm working on having better support for R-type adapters. Uh, again, I haven't really talked about that much, but it, it is kind of an important thing for being able to model uh, more complicated circuits with wave digital filters. So uh, that is something I definitely am trying to work on. Um, I also have some ideas for maybe how to perform, uh, have, have, better run, have better performance with the runtime API, uh, maybe using something like STD variant uh, or, or something like that. I'm still thinking about how that could work, but I would like to improve the performance there. Um, there's also some problems with propagating impedance. So uh, if you've got like three potentiometers, uh, every time you turn one potentiometer, that will propagate the impedance change throughout the tree so that any elements that need to know about that change uh, will have that change, uh, sort of, will, will be notified of that change, essentially. Um, and so if you have uh, three or four potentiometers that might all be changed at the same time, uh, that can be a little bit problematic because you might, your, your root node or your, your the, the, the node nearest to the root node might need to be notified like three or four times, uh, even though only one, only the only, even though it only needs one change to update for the next time step. Uh, sorry, I don't, I don't think I explained that very well, but I'm trying to figure out a way to be able to sort of combine these tree updates so that if you need to change multiple uh, resistors or multiple components at once, um, the, the impedance propagation will be deferred so that only the latest uh, impedance propagation happens for each element. Sorry, that might've been a bit confusing. Uh, and then I've also been experimenting with maybe having some neural networks uh, in wave digital filters, but that's for another day. So yeah, thanks again for, uh, for watching and thanks to uh, Josh and Timur for having me to give this talk. I, I really appreciate it. And yeah, I'm happy to take questions or anything like that. And also feel free to contact me uh, in either of these places. Cool. Thank you.